You know, there's kind of a little bit of a challenge by having the topic technology. Two challenges, actually. Three, if you consider I have to follow the famous Steve Archer. But the second one would be, you people hate technology. <laughs> More than likely, some of you in this crowd are like, oh no, he's speaking about technology, can I sit in the foyer? Probably because when you deal with technology, <laughs> it makes you feel like that, right? We all have been there, it all feels like that. Or maybe you're worried, like Don says, that there's a social stigma with it. You will see a Christ and Prophecy coming up where Dr. Reagan calls me a nerd on national television. You will see that. But there's other reasons. A lot of times, too, we think that eventually technology might even take us over, right? Our creations will try to replace us as we have tried to replace God. Or, in the process, we will lose our humanity and no longer even see humans anymore as technology is integrated into our lives. The second challenge is this. It's just about lunchtime. And you all want to go to lunch. So some of you who hate technology and want to go to lunch, I promise you that I can do my entire presentation in one minute. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. All right. So I'm about to do it in one minute. I'm Nathan Jones with your Bible Prophecy Insight. Can you believe the technology we have today? I mean, jets, cell phones, x-rays, Mars explorers even, uh, we seem to have it all. And yet, it all came about in just the last few decades. And did you know that many of our technologies today were foretold in the Bible 2,500 years ago? The books of Daniel and Revelation describe mass transportation, satellite communications, television, computers, the internet, nuclear weapons, and a great population explosion. And all of this was to come just as Jesus is about to return. To learn more about Bible prophecy, come visit us at lamblion.com. I can't tell if you're clapping because it was a good video or because it was one minute long. <laughs> but you know, the real reason I think that we have technology is because we like to torment our pets. <laughs> it's true. I have a beagle <clears throat> who's always digging underneath the fence. This would be great for her. <laughs> yeah. Cats deserve this, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Any of you all folks brought your pet to this conference? Really? Some people bring their pets wherever they go, including scuba diving. <laughs> but you know what? Most technology, with all our creative genius as humans, we tend to use it, or I should say misuse it. For one, making something like what's called the womb with the view. This is how wheelchairs work in Texas, folks, off-roading. <clears throat> the Japanese are just such masters of technology, aren't they? That's if you want to get down the hallway and lose your self-esteem all at the same time. Anybody here love watermelon? You can take your watermelon wherever you want to go. <laughs> this, personally, I love this. A slide at every staircase. <laughs> now, before we get into the end times and technology, we need to define the term, because I'm going to be saying technology a lot. So let's look at some of the definitions here. The Greek for technologist is technologia. It means a systematic treatment of art and skill. Say what? How about the science dictionary? The use of scientific knowledge to solve practical problems. Okay, but do we need science? How about the practical application of knowledge? It's pretty good. Or how about this one? The sum of the ways in which social groups provide themselves with the material objects of their civilization. Or I'm going to put it in my own definition. Applying what you know to fix problems and make stuff. <laughs> right? So, Technology does what? It fixes problems and it 
So is technology so bad? Yes. Who said yes? No, because I'm going to disprove that. Because you know where technology comes You know where knowledge comes from, where wisdom comes from? It comes from God, right. Look at this verse, Job 21, 22. Can anyone teach knowledge to God? You don't sound very sure. <laughs> no, no one can teach. Or how about Job 37, whoops, Job 37, 16. Him who is perfect in knowledge. That means God is flawless. He's absolutely perfect. He's the ultimate in knowing things. Or Isaiah 40, 14. Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him understanding and showed him the path of understanding? Nobody. Nobody, right? He's the author and the creator. He knows everything. And then you can understand then why the Apostle Paul cried out in Romans 11:33, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths are beyond tracing out. That means that everything that we ever knew came from God. You know that also means that as while we're in heaven and we are there with him forever, we will continually learn and learn and learn, and we, you know what? We will never catch up to God in what he knows. Is that exciting? Eternity of learning and growing. But you know what? Not only is God the source, he is the keeper of knowledge. Proverbs twenty two twelve 12 says, the eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. In other words, God keeps it. He views knowledge as a commodity. Colossians 2-3, in whom who are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. The treasure, the treasure of knowledge. In Proverbs 2-6, for the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And to the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. So, not only is the source of knowledge, he is the keeper of knowledge, but we are told here he is the provider of knowledge. And folks, I'm gonna, this is a huge point that we're going to make, is that I'm going to make the argument that the technology, the knowledge, the information that we have today was only given to us by God when he saw fit to give it to us. You know how the president said, you didn't make that. <laughs> I didn't make that. What I know, I didn't make that. God gave it to us. Well, look, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. So, for folks, if you are wise and knowledgeable in your pursuit of him, he will give you more of that. 1 Corinthians 12, 8. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of that same Spirit. So if you're knowledgeable or wise, it's because, folks, the Holy Spirit made you that way. Yes, amen, work through it. Yes, he made us that way. Well, look at 1 Timothy 2.4, because you know what? God has promised certain things about knowledge. 1 Timothy 2.4, who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Who does God want to be saved? All men, right. Some denominations and people will tell you, no, that's not true. But God wants all men to be saved. Now, whether they accept that knowledge or not, that's a different story. But when it comes to knowledge concerning God, salvation, God gives it freely. Or Titus 1-2, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. When did God promise salvation? From the beginning of time, even before mankind sinned. Now, we have knowledge, but what if we don't have knowledge? What happens when people lack knowledge? Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is our understanding. If you have no knowledge of the Holy One, what do you have? Nothing. Without a respect for God to seek Him and to learn Him, our man-made knowledge becomes absolutely useless. Take, for instance, 1 Timothy 6.20. Turn away from the godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. So there is real knowledge that comes from God, and then there is knowledge that is man-made, that it's apart from God. But is it really knowledge? No. Can we say evolution? I mean, it turns geniuses into idiots. <laughs> Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge. 
without the knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Savior, who died for your sins, who rose again and put your faith and trust in him, you will die in this earth and you will die in hell forever without that knowledge. My people are destroyed from that lack of knowledge. What is the destiny of knowledge? It's twofold. 1 Corinthians 13, 18. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. You know, folks, a lot of us are built up on our egos, our esteems, on what we know and how we know it and how we share it and how often we share it. And you know what? That knowledge, that man-made earthly knowledge that we put so much stock into, it's going away. It won't be here anymore. It'll be replaced with this, Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. That's all that matters. Folks, forever and ever, we will know the true knowledge of God. So, if God's the source of knowledge, and he's the application of knowledge, is wisdom to <laughs> fix problems and to <laughs> make stuff, then is technology good or bad? I still haven't any takers yet. All right, we'll do a game. You tell me, good or bad? Good. I like to stay warm. Good. How many have walked here? Aww. Yeah, the baby, but the glass, right? Mirrors, especially ladies, love mirrors, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank the Egyptians for that one. And finally, who could be without this? <laughs> well, what's the alternative, right? Good or bad? Good. Well, let's look at the progress of technology as it gone through time with this next little video. And you'll see, uh, take a look. Notice how the inventions start coming faster to us, quicker, more powerful.
Now, did you all notice how the inventions got more powerful? They came quicker. They were all built on top of each other. And they come more intense, more frequent. Kind of like those birth pangs we're hearing about as you get closer to Jesus' return, huh? Well, take a look at this, for instance. This is called the exponential curve. What we're seeing is that one is exponential growth. As one discovery builds on top to another, there's a growth curve. And this particular one is computers. And let me just narrow it down to you. There's a lot of uh, stuff on there. But if this keeps going, in two short years, we're expected to have a computer with the brain power equivalent of a mouse. I haven't reached here yet. By 2023, the equivalent of the human brain, and by 2045, just three decades, we'll have computers with the computation, computational ability to equal the entire human race. And you know what? The exponential curve is not just limited to computers. For while there's biomedical, space science, chemical engineering, human engineering, all the science has been climbing faster and steeper as the curve passes each and every day. Well, where is all this going? Now, before I get into that, I want to back up a little. Because you know what? There's this general idea that people in the Bible were a bunch of primitives who dragged their wives around by their hair, lived in caves, fought with each other, and hated science. They just hated it. But that's not true. Let's go back to the flood, 4,000 B.C. to about 2348, around the time of the flood, 1,656 years. Let's look at the technology that early man had. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So even before the fall of man, there was working of the land. There was learning of horticulture, botany. All the sciences were being discovered. New technologies were formed to handle the agricultural work. And we're talking about just two people to begin with, right? Must have been very smart people. How about textiles? When Adam and Eve sinned, they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. I tell you, they, they, they had to invent the needle or something. They didn't just say, how do we get, you know, stick the... <laughs> and, uh, they, they had to figure it out. They did. How about weaponry? After they got kicked out, right? A, the two angels had a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. You know, mankind did not invent weapons. Mankind saw weapons from heaven first. Think about that one. Or how about this one? tools. Now, Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Did Cain dig with his hands? No, he invented tools. How did Abel shear sheep? He had to invent a knife. People knew how to invent things to fix problems and right. They knew how to do that even then. Wow, our ancestors were smart. How about construction? After Cain was cast out, he was supposed to wander, but what did he do instead? He built a city. You know what? Mankind did not live in caves going ooh, 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 all the time. They did not. They knew how to build cities. Or how about mining and refining? We got Tubal Cain, for instance, who forged all kinds of tools with bronze and iron. You know, to forge tools, that means you have to know how to do refining and furnaces and weights and meteorology. I mean, he knew all this stuff. Or how about shipbuilding? Noah. Noah had to build the biggest boat ever made. Sure, it took him 100 years or so, but it takes a lot. You need to know woodworking, crafts. You have to have the right tools for the job, measuring devices. He had to have all that. And then Noah. As soon as he gets out of the ark, what's he do? He gets drunk. But he knew how to do fermentation. He knew vats. He knew the processes and all. So, yeah, I know. Mankind's always been up with fermentation. Okay, now let's look post-flood. Genesis 50. Joseph directed the physician in his service to embalm his father Israel. The Egyptians were master doctors at the time. Modern doctoring, if you want to say, isn't as modern as we think it is. A lot of these methods come from ancient times. Or how about wheels and transportation? There were wheels back during the Egyptian times even. People weren't just dragging things around on, on pallets and stuff like that. How about writing? The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll. There was implementations. There's paper. There's inks. You know, it wasn't just chiseling on rocks. But that's a technology too, right? How about tent making? This is about making the tabernacle, the most ornate tent ever made up to that time period. And that involved all sorts of skills and weaving and design work, meteorology, and then musical instruments. How many of you all played a musical instrument? Those things are pretty complicated. I mean, all those buttons and things like that, and yet they had all sorts of fantastic instruments in that time period. So you know what, folks? I want to make the argument that the Bible is absolutely filled with technology. Because God wants us to? Right. 
Technology. Good. Now, technology can be misused, though. And I want to talk to you now about the nine tech signs of the end times. Where is technology going? Where is it taking us? And what could it mean? Sign number one, that we know that Jesus is coming soon. Knowledge. This is from Daniel 12.4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So here we're talking about after the angel tells Daniel all that's about to happen, he gives the context of it in verse 4 and 9. The time of the end, the end times, the latter years, the last days, the time of Jesus' second coming. And the Bible always refer, uses those terms to explain when he's coming. Now what kind of technology would existed because a massive growth in learning? Knowledge shall increase. Computers, to be able to store knowledge, all the discoveries that come on top of it, our ability to amass the amount of knowledge that we have today, which some say that a hundred years ago, the equivalent of knowledge that people had then was one issue of the Sunday paper of New York Times in their entire life. With technology today, we can learn like we've never learned before. So, an increase in knowledge means that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Same verse, number two, transportation. Many shall run to and fro. Again, the context is the end times. So the closer we get to Jesus, the more people will run to and fro and farther and faster. Now, I live in Princeton, and most of the people in Princeton have never lived Princeton. It's just what they do. But do you know the rest of the world is, I'm sorry, I'm not making fun of you, Kathy. But most people know, they, they travel all over the planet. They get around. They go places all over. How many of you flew here? Wow, most of you drove? God bless you. <laughs> Knowledge and transportation. That means that Jesus is coming soon. Number three, the mark of the beast. Let's read through this. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich or poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now let me give you some context here for the mark of the beast. During the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, that's a time period of like the flood where God is going to pour his wrath on the world. And it says at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to set up a system of commerce where you can't buy or sell unless you have the Antichrist name or number on your hand or on your forehead. Now let's make highlight these two points. Midpoint of tribulation, on your hand or forehead. People can see it. When John wrote about this, the Apostle John, he could see the name or the number on the people who have sworn their allegiance to the Antichrist. So this is important because we get emails all the time into ministry with people terrifying that barcode will be put on their head or they'll get a chip implanted in their bodies. They would have taken the mark of the beast. And as you know, and it's a good big concern for the people in tribulation, that the mark of the beast means you're condemned to hell. That's it. You've sworn your allegiance to Satan. There's no chance of going back. But you know what, folks? This is something that will be implemented at the midpoint. Where is the church going to be during the tribulation? We're out of here. Can any of you accidentally take the mark of the beast? No. Do you have to worry about being chipped? Well, yeah, I don't want to be chipped, frankly, but it's not the mark of the beast. So what kind of technologies would come during the tribulation time? More than likely, since it's visible, it's got to be some kind of tattoo. But a lot of the inks nowadays are magnetic reader inks that people can scan and store information in. Can you believe that? You can have your whole health history built right into your credit card information etched in through magnetic ink. Maybe an RFID chip is involved, embedded underneath whatever that mark is. I don't know. It's possible. How do you connect all that information? Oh, maybe you build giant data centers in Utah, call them PRISM, perhaps, <laughs> to connect all the world's information together. It might be. And you also need to connect e-commerce. You also need to connect the internet. So all these technology are coming together so that the anti can control, Antichrist control all the technology all the commerce control the people during the tribulation. So that technology exists today, and that means that Jesus is coming soon. Sign number four, and it's a wonderful sign. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, technology has played a huge part in evangelism in this time. 
I am talking to hundreds of people all over the planet right now, and they're not in this room. Praise the Lord. I mean, that's the kind of technology we have. We have more technology today to reach more people than ever before. God wants us to get that word out. He's using us, using that communication tool to get us to share that gospel. But there's also a different type of evangelism. That's the evangelism today, but during the tribulation, God has a different plan. God has a plan to use 144,000 evangelizing Jews. He's got a plan to use all the information we leave behind after the rapture. He has a plan to use this gospel angel who will go throughout the whole world, and then when the end will come. That's what Jesus is talking about there, the second coming, not the rapture. The whole world will be evangelized by the end of the tribulation, not before the rapture. Otherwise, everybody be saved, right? Before the trib- there'd be nobody in the tribulation. It wouldn't make sense. But during that time, let's look at the two witnesses, Revelation 11, 9 through 10. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, these two, anti, uh, excuse me, these two witnesses will be there in Jerusalem for three and a half years. The Antichrist will kill them. They will die, and they will be stuck there for three and a half days. And you know what? The world will party over it. And then God will resurrect them and take them to heaven. And it says the whole world gets to watch it. Now, is the whole world on Ben Yehuda Street? No. It's through t- the only way to understand this te- is through technology. And only today can our generation understand that it's possible. Now, what kind of technology would be needed to watch something on the other side of the planet? Communication technology, multimedia, satellite technology, phone systems, cell lines, cell phones, cameras, television, the internet. All that technology has to come together to get that message out. So, evangelizing the world and how close we are to reaching people all over the world with the gospel through different technologies means that Jesus is coming soon. Now let's look at the image of the Antichrist. This is sign number five. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven and earth in full view of men. Because of the sign he was given great power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Now, what does that exactly mean? During the tribulation, besides the mark of the beast, the Antichrist will have his false prophet set up a statue of him. It's kind of similar to when Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue, and he made everybody worship it. And Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, what did they do? They wouldn't do it. They stood up, and they got thrown into the fiery furnace. Well, this is all going to happen again, part two. Somehow this image is going to be set up, and anyone who refuses to worship it, the Antichrist, the false prophet, fire will come down and destroy those people who refuse to worship it. And another strange thing, it says this image is given life. Now Nebuchadnezzar's statue didn't get up and walk around and sing and dance and all that. It didn't move, but this image, the Antichrist image, will be given life. So now, If there's nothing supernatural involved, like a possession of an object or something, which still couldn't move anyway, then what kind of technology could the false prophet use? Well, first, let's look at the fire. How do you make fire fall down from heaven and consume people? Assuming it's not supernatural, pyrotechnics. Look at all the pyrotechnic technology for fire to come down. What about lasers? Do you know how it could be up there now? But how long different countries have been working to have a satellite-based laser system to just zap people from outer space? I mean, whatever it is, the Antichrist will be able to use this technology because he's a counterfeit. He's not a real miracle maker. And they will use this technology to destroy people. Or what about the image itself? How is this image given life? Well, one, it could be a giant robot, and certainly robotic technology is coming. But you know what? I tend to think that it's a fully functional hologram, and this is why. In Japan, just three years ago, a Japanese created Hatsune Miku, a fully interactive almost self-aware hologram that sang in a live concert called, and she sang the song, ironically enough, The World Is Mine. I'll let you take a look at it.
She is the most popular pop singer in Japan right now. Now, if you have a computer a few years down the line that has the computational power of a human being, who's to say that there won't be AI technology to back this up? So I, I believe that the Antichrist more than likely will be a hologram, easier to transport, easier to move, talks, interacts, can be whatever you look like, and can even look like an anima character like that. So that live image technology exists today to make this image of the Antichrist come alive means that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Now look at the number six, population. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Now, prepare the way for what? Revelation 9, 16. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. And they were trampled in the wine press outside the city. The blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridle, for a distance of 180 miles. Folks, we're talking about the slaughter of a eastern army that's rebelling against the Antichrist. It crosses the Euphrates. The Antichrist is busy with the rebellion in the south. His whole empire is falling apart by the end of the tribulation. He turns around. He attacks this massive army in the valley of Armageddon. And it says the blood runs high as a horse's bridle for 180 miles. Now don't forget, by the end of the tribulation, most of the world population is wiped out. Yet, the kings of the east can amass an army of that caliber. How do you get a human population so large at that time period? Unless you have the medicines that we have today, or the population, the exponential curve again. That curve is every human makes more humans and they make more humans. You get a massive population. And because our population today is large enough, and because the kings of the east, China and India and all those, can form an army that large, it means one thing. Jesus Christ is coming soon, right? Now let's look at nuclear weapons. These are Old Testament and New Testament descriptions of what a nuclear bomb might look like. In the evening, sudden terror, before the morning day, the city of Damascus are gone. Now, we got Bill Salas here at the conference. Ask him what that means. But if there is any prophecy that is right around the corner right now, folks, it is going to be the destruction of the oldest city on the planet, Damascus, by Israel suddenly in one night. How do you destroy an entire city in just one night? Nuclear bomb. Here's some of the other examples. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Luke 21, 26. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. It was hurled down the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. So throughout the tribulation, many of God's wrath judgment sound like a first century man trying to explain a nuclear holocaust. Now, folks, I can say nuclear holocaust in, in our comfortable room. we like, that's nice. Well, let me show you what nuclear weapons look like. Now, in this video, you, most of us think, at least I have for years thought, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that's it. Maybe a few tests here and there. Look at the top number. See the years go by. The blips are every nuclear bomb that's ever been detonated on this planet. And the bottom number will give you the tally of how many of those have been let off.
We have blown up 2,000 nuclear warheads on this planet. We wonder why we're getting cancer and all. But isn't it amazing that more nuclear weapons haven't been used in military actions since World War II? That's God's hand restraining. Restraining for what? Till when? Folks, do you know that the beginning of the tribulation, the first year or so, half the world population will die? How do you annihilate half a world population? What did the disciples and the Old Testament prophets describe? A nuclear holocaust is coming on this world one day. We've been anxiously building our own demise. And it just, it saddens me to think that that's the future. But what kind of technologies do you need to develop for that? Heavy metal refinement, nuclear containment, nuclear plants and missiles for deployment. And folks, we have that technology today. Nuclear destruction in the tribulation means that Jesus Christ is coming soon. I'm going to throw this one out. This isn't an official sign. This is a Nathan sign. I think us Bible prophecy teachers are allowed to jump a little here. I'm going to. I'm going to throw out a tentative sign of technology, Isaiah 14, 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Now, morning star is a name that Isaiah attributed to Satan. And during the tribulation, Satan will be worshipped through the Antichrist, and the earth will be utterly destroyed by 21 judgments. It would barely survive by the end of it. Do you know that the International Space Station, half a trillion dollar project, sits up in the sky? It can be seen in the morning, and do you know what it's called? The morning star. How do you escape a world that's being annihilated? Sit up on high and rule from there? I don't know. I'm throwing that one out. That's tentative. I have no biblical proof for it. But that thing is sitting up there for some purpose other than seeing if earthworms can float. <laughs> All right. Sign number nine, the limits of technology. Do you know that our technology has limitations? For one, rare metals. Do you know this computer I have in front of me is made out of rare metals? 95% of them you can only get in China. You know 5% of them you get in Afghanistan? Huh, I wonder why we're in Afghanistan. To make the technology we have today, there's only certain places where those metals can be found, and they are quickly dwindling to the point of nothing. The ability to have laptops, cell phones, TVs, you name it, is quickly going to disappear because we're losing the components to be able to make it. So the limitations of rare earth metals will end technology at some point. Or how about space exploration? All the nations of the earth are gathered against her. It's talking about all the world gathered against uh, Jerusalem in the last days. Or when Jesus comes back and he has this big judgment called the sheep goat judgments. All the nations are gathered before him. Now if all the nations stand before Jesus Christ to be judged and also try to attack uh, Jerusalem earlier, that means there cannot be people living on space stations, lunar colonies, Mars colonies, extra earth settlements. It means that the people are confined to earth, which means that our advancement in outer space isn't going to happen, according to the Bible. And then there's this, the limits of tribulation technology. If you have two earthquakes that ravage the world, what happens to all the mountains? They get leveled. What happens to the cell phone towers standing out there? They fall over. What happens when solar flares are burning up the sky? What happens to the satellites? They get destroyed. What happens when the oceans are filled like, with blood and dead animals are all over so the ships can't bring oil to port? What do you get? Folks, by the end of the tribulation, I believe that most technology, our man's last crutch, our own Tower of Babel, will be removed from them. So as John said, the people are out there fighting with bows and arrows and horses again. Certainly there'll be tanks and other things I'm sure the Antichrist will get. But God has to take that technology away from us even by the end of the tribulation so that man is left with nothing but to choose him. So that since technology is running out, we know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Knowledge, travel, mark of the beast, evangelism, the image of the Antichrist, population, nukes, space science, and the limitation of technology, all today point to the soon return of Jesus Christ. So what should we be doing with that time? We know the Lord's coming soon. We know our time here on earth is short. Look at what we can do. We can evangelize. Do you know that 86% of the people in the country as of last year are accessible by the internet? You can talk to people anywhere, 86% of them. In China, it went from 10% to 36% in just five years. 
Overall, 33% of the world last year was accessible through the internet. So what does that mean? What is Lamb and Lion going to do about it? Because you know what? Our mission is to proclaim the gospel, the soon return of Jesus Christ to every person on the planet as fast as we can and as quickly as we can. And our web ministry is to proclaim the soon return of Jesus Christ to every person on the internet and during the church age and the tribulation. That's a wonderful thing about the internet. We can leave things behind. Yeah, praise the Lord. And we do that through our website and blog at lamblion.com and lamblion.us. We do it through podcasting where we send out audio mp3s where you can listen to our shows and interviews. We do it through social networks like Facebook and many of the folks that are here streaming are from our Facebook group. We have wonderful moderators there. It's a safe place where you can share the gospel. You can share your concerns, your thoughts. I recommend join the 5,000 plus people that are on our Facebook group. E-newsletters. Sign up for it on our homepage. Every other week we'll send you a, a bit of prophetic information, update on what's going on in the world and what we need to be concerned about. We create web videos because people on the internet don't have a long attention span. What? No, we don't. We don't have a long attention span whatsoever. So we make these cute little videos and we put them out there. But there are hooks to bring people back and get them to understand the gospel and learn about Jesus Christ. Dr. Reagan's books. Almost all of them are e-books, and if you are a Kindle person or a Nook person, you can get your books. Coming to iPad soon. Yes, Don Perkins, it is coming to iPad very soon. And we have our app. Go downstairs, the end of the, bottom of the balcony, scan with your QR reader, get the Lamb and Lion app. We've got about 10,000 people have downloaded so far, and it's basically Lamb and Lion in your pocket. Now, how do we apply this, all that we have learned here today? How do we apply what we learn about the signs of technology in our lives? Two, one, the technology today tells us as we study our Bibles that our time is now, that Jesus Christ is coming soon for each and every one of you here who've accepted Jesus as their Savior. It also means that we don't have much time left. We are living on borrowed time. And that means that we need to get out there. We need to share the gospel. God gave us like this massive, awesome car. Like think of it that way. You've got this great Lamborghini sitting there. Do you drive it? Yes, you drive it. We've got this great, well, not this chair. It's not Lamborghini. But we've got this massive technology that we need to use to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So are you recognizing the signs? Do you now understand that Jesus is coming for each and every one of you? Will it be at the rapture, or will it be through the 21 judgments of the tribulation? If you are saved today, then use this Lamborghini, use this technology, and share it. God's given it to us. He's given us it so that we can use it. Use it. And if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you don't know him as your Lord, don't leave this auditorium without accepting Jesus as your Savior. I want to say, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins and be my Savior. And you know what? The Lord will transform your life, and you will have the hope that everybody else here has, that we are going up with Jesus to be with him forever, our Lord, our Savior, the one who loves our soul, who calls us children. Don't give that up today. Lord, I thank you so much for the love that you have given each and every person here. I do pray for them, Lord, as we go through this conference, that you will just touch our lives, and Lord, primarily that you will be glorified. And Lord, if there's anybody here or online watching this who hasn't accepted you as Savior, now's the time. Lord, may they say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Be my Savior with all their hearts. May they give their lives to you and accept your salvation. Have the hope that we have that you're returning for us. Lord, I thank you for the technology you've given us, equipped us to be able to share the gospel. And we pray, Lord, all this will be for your glory and honor. Amen. Amen. Amen.